Father, we thank you for times and moments like this in your presence. A time you have given to us that we might celebrate your goodness. A time that we come before your throne of grace to get revived and to be strengthened with minds by your word and by your spirit. We have come at such a time like this in the midst of the congregation of the saints. Let our hearts be wide open. Let our mind be alert. And by the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, grant us deep understanding to what you are set to teach us tonight. So Lord, we can have this word of yours working mightily in our lives. We thank you. And we give you all praise. That in times like this, when darkness is combed the world, you are always there to lift us up into your great light so that our lives are preserved in you. Tonight, I decree the blessing upon your people. Tonight, I decree empowerment for success upon your people. Tonight, I decree, Lord, that ability to be able to produce results that we desire in life to your people. May your grace be sufficient. May success and progress become a portion. May your word work mightily in and through us. And may your word bring unto us its intended results that your name might be glorified. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Shall we be seated and give the Lord a big clap of friend? Praise the Lord. We are called the children of God. We are called the beloved ones of God. And if that is it, then we truly need his word working in us. And we need this word working in us to get the intended glories of the word made a reality in every area of our life. There is an intended glory God has designed for you and me in Christ. That's why we have been given his life manual. All the declarations and the decrees from the Bible are not just meant there to tickle us. God has written them as words that can become reality in your life. He's written them as words that can become reality in my life. If only we will have the word work in us. Hallelujah. Or else we are going to get ourselves entangled with the affairs of this world. If the word is not at work in us, we get ourselves entangled with the affairs of this life. And not only that, without the word at work in us, we are going to go through hardships. And we will not know how to come out of it. My Bible says he that is born of God. We have the ability to overcome. But it takes the word. Praise the Lord. To give us that ability to come out. It takes the engrafted part of the word. The spirit part of the word. Not the letter. To empower you and me to come out. Or we will be beaten and battered in life journey. Many Christians are beaten and battered. Why? Because the word is not working in them. Yes, we come to church, we get triggered on by the word. We get blessed by the word. Uh, we have emotions when the word comes at a particular point in time. But when we leave his presence, when we leave the congregation of the saints, because the word has not been given the needed attention, we walk with an empty spirit, and then our life becomes something else. Hallelujah. But tonight we are going to continue with the subject matter. We started on Sunday morning. Which topic is entitled the word working in you? The word working in you. Is the word of God working in you? I think we should, be evaluated. We should take time to evaluate our life now since this team has come. Anytime God opens us up to new revelation realities, his, intended, his, his intention is that we will be able to walk in the same. Praise the Lord. Is the word working in you? I issued some statements on Sunday, which I think is worth repeating tonight. And this is what I said. I said, the reason why the entire world is where it is now. If you are a man and a woman of the spirit, you find out the world is not going the right direction it ought to go. Yes, inventions are being popped up. Many new things are coming. Knowledge is increasing. But when it comes to the area of morality, it becomes something else. And God is with morality. He said, the Lord loved the gates of Zion more than his dwellings. Hallelujah. 
The entire world is where it is because of the neglect of God's word in our lives. This generation, these last days, don't care about God's word anymore, even including the born again believer in Christ. Many people, many, many in these last days are mostly stirred or moved or mot by motivational talks. We are stirred and moved by philosophies and the ideologies of men rather than the word of God. Many are moved. When people begin to express wisdom, and I talk about natural wisdom, people get moved. But when you begin to express the wisdom of God, it becomes something else. But I tell you, without the wisdom of God, which is the word of God being expressed outwardly, we cannot survive this life that we live in now. Neither can we survive even eternity with him. And just as the writer said, it is a very unfortunate situation. But this is where man in these last days have gotten ourselves into. Lack of the word. Lack of the desire. Place our eyes in the Ten Commandments. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't type that. If you want to live that life of focus on don'ts, 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 you will not be able. Because the power is not given for the Old Testament to be able to fulfill the purpose for why it was documented. But when we come to grace, power is given to us. That's why in this dispensation of grace, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling everyone that confesses the Lordship of Jesus. But in the Old Testament, yes, God gave them the Lord. Don't do that. And he made them focus on it. Do you know why? He wanted them to know that without him, they cannot the man in his own strength will not be able to accomplish what God has designed for him or her or what God expects from him or her. So he brought Jesus Christ to die and the Holy Spirit came to indwell us. And so now we have the personality of the Godhead living in us with all the ability and power of God. So when we look at the word of God and we meditate and we agree with God, the word brings us to that place where we are told that we are. Hallelujah. We are whom we are in Christ. We can do what the blood says we can do. And we have been gifted with animals deposit of treasure in us, as the word says concerning our life. There are several scriptures, as I said, in the Bible that warns the Christians. It warns us about our dependence on these teachings what are my term false teachings or doctrines of men and philosophies of men? And last Sunday, we took time to go through several scriptures that gives us counsel concerning these false teachings and ideologies of men. And some of these scriptures, as I said, was we looked at the book of First Timothy, the chapter 1, 3 to 4. I'm not expecting on the board. We looked at First Timothy, the chapter 1, the verses 3 to 4. We looked at First Timothy, the chapter 4, the verses 7 to 8. We also looked at 2 Timothy, the chapter 4, the verses 3 to 5. We also looked at the book of Titus, the chapter 1, the verse 10 to 14. And then 2 Peter also, the chapter 1, and Colossians chapter 2, the verse 8. In all these things, the Bible rightly makes us aware that in this last days, man does not want sound doctrine. Man's attention is moving towards the ideologies and the teachings of men. And that's the reason why things have become the way it is in these ladies. All these warnings were given years ago by God's Spirit so that as modern day Christians, we will learn to adhere to a true doctrine of God's word instead of hearkening to these false teachings and the ideologies of men. Yes, most of the, some of the ideologies have been so good, but there's how far the ideology of men will be able to take you into. Some of the wisdom of men express, oh, they look so nice, but there's how far it can take you into. It only has a reward here, but it doesn't have a reward in heaven. But even not all of them that has a reward here, some of us, some of them leads us into perversion. Hallelujah. And I think this is the reason why we ought to do diligence study, every one of us. If you are called a child of God, if you think you belong to the kingdom, then diligence study should be your way of life. Diligence study of the word so that when people are teaching errors, it will be very easy 
for us to identify. Why many are sweeping to places, and I call some of the places are covens. They are witches' covens. They are the devil's covens. Many are flagged there. They are swam to that place. And they don't know what is happening. Even when wrong and other teachings are going on, they don't know. All they want to see is to buy something. Either something for the neck, something for the hands, something to smear on their body, something to drink. If there was the life that Jesus gave to us, we wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't have come. It's not about drinking something. It's not about smearing something. It's not about tying off your hands with something. No, it's not about that. Our life is a life of faith. And faith is dependent on the things that you do not see with your optical eye. But what the word of God says concerning a given situation. That's what faith is all about. So if it's about tying your hands and putting things around your neck and smearing things on your body and drinking things, that's not faith's life. It's not even a life of hope. Bible says the thing that we see and we hope for, is if we can see them, then it's not hope. There's every sign to show when the word of God is at work in an individual. There's every sign to show. And there's also that sign when someone is without, without the word in their inner man. There's every sign to show. When the word is at work in you, there are certain ways that the Holy Spirit expresses through you. There are certain actions that the Holy Spirit expresses through you. There are certain things that you do that will not be your strength or your ability, but because... The word is working in you and the word is a force and the word is spirit and the word is life. It produces life in your life. The word of God actually illumines one's destiny. It puts bright light on your destiny. When the word is at work in, is at work in you, you see clearly your calling in Christ. You see clearly what you ought to do as a child of God. So the word illumines when it's in force. And because it is the greatest light, I said we have different kinds of light on this planet Earth. We have the light of the moon, the light of the sun. We have the light of education. We have the light of man. But we have the light of God, which is his word. And the light of God's word is the greatest among all the lights that one can ever think of. And this light of God's word molds and as well as shapes the course of our life on earth. And as well as prepare you and me for eternity with God. The light of God molds us. It shapes the course of our destiny. It prepares us for eternity with God. That's what the light of God does. The light of man is just for enjoyment on this world. It's just for certain advantages that you have on this earth. And it ends there. But the light of God actually brings us into eternity with God and eternal things, eternal, the, value, the eternal value, valuable things. When the word is at work in you, there are many signs that can be seen as a testimony that the word is taking control of your life. And I, look, I took time to go through several of them last Sunday. If you want to have the glimpse of these signs of the word of God at work in an individual you can revisit the part one of this very message we are treating tonight. I further explained concerning two types of statements. And I think there's a need to get them in their right perspective when it comes to the word of God. And I said we shouldn't get ourselves confused. Because, we've been, because when it is said that we've been blessed by the word. We don't get ourselves confused with this terminology being blessed by the word. When being blessed by the word of God issues and when the term, the word at work in you issues because there are two different experiences altogether. When we say one is blessed of the word, it means one is welcomed and gotten in contact with the word. You say, I'm blessed by the word. That means you have given the word entrance. You have given the word that opportunity to work in you. And this experience might get you excited and that's what happens Mostly when the word is taught in the, in the house of God. Some get excited physically. They get excited emotionally. They get excited spiritually. To the word that came to them. But this stage of being blessed of the word or getting excited does not come with 
that inherent power of God's word to produce results. There is a power and an ability that is embedded in God's word. And it's that power that produces the results of the word. So when you get blessed with the word, that inherent power of the word is not there to produce the intended results that God had designed the word to produce. You, you heard, as God said in the book of Isaiah, he said the word that goes out from him, from his mouth, does not come back to him void. That means everything that God says has to accomplish its intended purpose. So why is that God has said many things concerning our lives, but then the word does not accomplish its intended purpose. That means the challenge is with us. So there's that conversion power or the translating power of the word that effect changes in one's life. So when you get blessed of the word, it doesn't bring along with it the converted power or the translation power of the word. As I said, there's a power that the word of God contains, that contains in the word of God. So when you get excited by the word, that doesn't mean the power there is encapsulated in your excitement. So the conversion power and the translation power of the word of God is not embedded when you get blessed with the word. And so therefore you cannot realize or you cannot get blessed with the glories that God intends for your life. But rather there's another stage, as I said on Sunday, that one needs to ascend into in order to have the word of God converted into power. And this is the meditative stage. That gets God's word engrafted on the tablets of our hearts where we get faith born. You see, unfortunately, uh, necromizer and spiritism and all those religions that are of error have so much dealt with meditation that when we talk about meditation or meditation upon the word of God, it becomes very difficult for Christians to adhere to or to be able to comprehend. You know, because if you go to Guru Maharaj and all those things, yoga and things, meditation is in a state, a posture that you sit, you sit in a state, and now you begin to recite words. Those words, if you don't know what they're going to do in your life, they are not words from the word of God. So the moment you tell a child of God, meditate upon the word, it becomes something. And you see, the devil has a reason why he's perverted that word meditation. Meditation simply means think over a matter or brood over a matter. Contemplate, give your thoughts to something. Think about it. Or it means on something. What does this mean? Or maybe the thing has so much touched your heart that you begin to think, wow, is that the way this word is? So how does it work? So what? Does, and when you do that, it will tell you to want to go to study the word of God and God will open you up to greater revelation realities more than what you saw. So meditation is the second step everyone who is a child of God needs to take and take when you see yourself being blessed with the word. Because what meditation does is it gets the word engrafted upon the tablets of your heart and by that I mean it gets the word rooted in your spirit. And so when the, the word gets there, then the word is able to control your spirit, soul, and body. This is the state that you need to have the word of God converted into power. When you meditate upon the word and the word gets sunk into it, it gets, it gets sank, sunk into your heart, then becomes the controller of your life. It controls the way you think. It controls the way you act. It controls the way you speak. That's what meditation does. During the Soviet Union, they were brainwashing them. It's, it, it, in other terms, it's a source of meditation. You tell them one thing over and over again. Just like our brothers on the other side. You tell them something over and over again. And they think about it. And they think, and finally... It becomes, it, it, it channels the course of their destiny. Whatever you say, they're not going to take it. And they think it's right. That's what a power of meditation, meditation can do. It can be done on the wrong side. It can be done on the positive side. 
So when we meditate upon the word of God, the word gets engrafted on the tablets of our heart where we get our faith born. Everything that concerns faith comes out from your heart. Your heart is a place that faith is born. So the word needs to go to your heart. Otherwise, the faith that God demands from you for the glory to come, that faith will not be alive. Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's why you need the word there for your faith to be alive. Because Bible says faith is a substance of the things that we hope for and evidence of the things that we cannot see. So faith is not something that is tangible that you can, be, you can hold. But you see, when faith begins to work in you, the things that you are demanding or you are looking for, you are anticipating for, become very tangible in your spirit. Though you can't touch it. It becomes very tangible. And it takes the word of God because the word of God, faith is encapsulated in the word of God. And your heart is the place that faith gets born and get faith, faith gets function. So you need the word in your heart for it to be able to work. That is why you need meditation. Hallelujah. But unfortunately, most of the word of God that we look at, they stay in the realm of our mind. The word doesn't work there. If the word is in the realm of the soul, it doesn't work there. Your mind especially it doesn't work there. Because the mind is the battlefield of the enemy. If you leave the word, the devil will take it out. That's why Jesus Christ said, when we come to the house of God, the word is preached. We have categories of the way, categories of people and the way we receive the word. He says, some receive it when they go out, the challenge of life will cause the word to be taken away. And say some will receive it and they are able to keep it. And then also the word prospers 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. Some receive it, they are joyful. And then when they go away, it's just like when you sow a seed on the highway. It won't take time. The best will come and do what? And devoid. So if your word, the word of God remains in your mind, it's a, it's a challenge. The devil, the devil will take it off. You bring theories, you bring suggestions, and it will eradicate or it will erase that word that you have placed in your mind. So the best place for us to place the word of God is our heart. But you need to think about the word. You need to reminisce on the word. You need to keep on pondering on the word for, to get it there. It doesn't take one day. It doesn't take one moment. It doesn't take hours. It, takes, it might take months. It might take a year, as I said on Sunday. I can grab a word and everywhere I found myself and every opportunity I get, I want to speak concerning that word in diverse ways. And all that I'm doing is to get the word deep in my heart. Because the word that you stay on for a long time, the information that you stay on for a long time thinking about and speaking with the same, obviously will take control of your life. We do so with other things. We do so with other knowledge. But when it comes to the word of God, I don't know why it becomes very difficult for us to stay on that course. We do so. That's why most of us have our life in certain direction, which is not in the direction that God wants it to be. It is an information you have gathered and you stay on it severally. And then it functions in your life. Faith is born in our hearts. So you need the word which has got faith encapsulated in it in your heart for the word to be able to translate or to be able to empower you to be able to receive the resultant factor of the same. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So when you meditate upon the word for a number of times, you see this word positively affect your spirit, your soul, and your body. How did I know God loves me so much? Nobody can persuade me that God doesn't love me no matter my weaknesses. I'm not saying we should hold on to our weaknesses no matter my disposition. God loves me. I came to understand. Do you know why? In uh, some time, some years back, I saw in the Old Testament when the angel came to Daniel, the first thing salutation he gave to Daniel, and he repeated it three times. Oh, Daniel, thou art beloved. Oh, Daniel, thou art greatly beloved. Oh, Daniel, thou art greatly beloved. It was after this salutation when he said it three times before, he brought the information that he was supposed to bring to Daniel. I got intrigued by that statement. Oh, really? 
So God can tell an angel to tell us that he loves us. I said, wow. Ever since then, when I speak to him, I said, look, I pray one day I'll have an angel speak to me like an angel spoke to Daniel and said, you are greatly beloved. And I was always thinking about that. How do I come to that realm where I can have the love of God? I can be well assured of the love of God or get a prophet or an angel to tell me, look, God say he loves me. Until when I got into a challenge and sat down and studied the word of God and came to a place where the Bible says, we are greatly beloved. Or where the Bible says, we are, he told Mary, you are highly favored. It's the same word, the Greek rendering, karito, which means beloved ones. So you see Paul, you've seen it in all his messages. He said, beloved ones, beloved. Now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear. Beloved, beloved. You look to the Bible in the New Testament. It was Apostle Paul's contemplation with regards to the love of God for the children of God who are washed and set apart by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because I've been pondering over this for years and now I've got to a deep revelation of it in the New Testament. Because the Bible says the Old Testament is a shadow. So I said, well, if God can tell Daniel he loves me, then <laughs> my shall be, should be on a higher side. And what even pepped it up was when Jesus said, concern the wisdom of Solomon, how that great man, people travel far away to come to experience and to have the first hand information about how Solomon displayed wisdom. And Jesus said, a greater than Solomon is here. You know what I'm saying? That means <laughs> he's brought the highest form of wisdom to be expressed through man. All those things put together brought me to a place that I know, my goodness, God loves me. And you know, when you understand the love of God for your life, it gives you a certain kind of perception. You know, when you know somebody loves you, you don't want to hurt the fellow. Have you noticed that? So people just don't understand why God wants you to know you loves you. When you know somebody loves you, you don't want to hurt the fellow. Just look at our fellow men. Look at our, how do you call it, our relationship that we have with people, either with our wife, our spouses, or people that we are courting with. If we have it in order, we love them so much, you don't want to hurt them. Is that not it? You don't want to disappoint them. In the same way, when you understand the love of God, your walk on this earth will be very circumspect. You don't walk anyhow, because you will not like to, love, to hurt him. So when I understood this love of God, I got to know, look, God loves me. And because of his love, I'm able to love. And when we talk about God's love, it's beyond the human understanding because he calls his love agape. His love flows towards us irrespective of our weakness, irrespective of our performance. But you see, the fact is, we will know that God loves us, but if we don't have the deep understanding and we keep on going the other way around, when God throws the blessings, because he has blessed you to be on this pedestal, he throws the blessings here, you have gone off. The love of God should compel us to want to live for him. Hallelujah. And it takes the word of God encapsulated in your spirit. And it takes the meditation of the word to get the word encapsulated in your spirit. And it takes that faith instrument embedded in the word to cause your heart to begin to believe. And then now from there, everything that your spirit comes alive with with regards to the word of God, it turns into a reality. That's why sometimes you expect to have something. It takes time because your faith has not come alive. But when you keep at it, you keep on the word. Till you get the word engrafted in your heart, till you see faith arise, that thing will come. The moment your faith gets up, it gets alive. The thing that you are demanding for from the word of God will come to you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So when we get ourselves meditating on the word, it affects positively our spirit, soul, and body. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's what the Bible says in the book of Psalm 119 verse 119 verse 130. 
He said, the entrance of your words, it gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. Anytime the word of God gets entrance into your heart, it brings certain kinds of understanding. I mean, it gives you a certain kind of perception or a kind of mentality. Even no matter how weak, no matter how seducible you are, it gives you a kind of mental, mental image that conforms with the word of God so that the glory of God can be unleashed upon your life. When the word gets entrance into your spirit, then faith, which is a spiritual form, begins to react and respond to the word you welcome. And at this point of st or stage, power is released for an effective delivery in your life. There's always the power of God embedded in this word, ready to be unleashed in your life. Every day, every moment. Even as you sit now, with a challenge that you are going through. No matter how you think the challenge is. God has made his word ready for delivery in your life. Praise the Lord. If only you respond to it. So yes, we have to be blessed of the word. Or in other words, you have to welcome the word. But there's a further step we need to take. If you want to experience the glories and the empowerments of God's word. Unveiling our life. And this further, an extra step one needs to take with regards to God's word. After being blessed is by staying focused on the word. That means you focus on the word. You stay on the word. You think on the word. You meditate on the word. Or you keep meditating on the word till his spirit dominates or controls you in every way. The word of God is a spirit. He said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The word ought to be spirit fed before they, are, they become life. They can become life and spirit. They are life, spirit fed, then they become life. So the spirit of the word will not begin to dominate and to control you. That's when you can be able to enjoy the glories that God has designed for your life. Until we allow the word of God to dominate us. Until you allow the spirit of the word to take control of our lives. That's what it means by what? The word working in you. The word working in me. That means the spirit of the word has taken total control of your life. So when you think or you take actions, it's the spirit behind the word that steers you into thinking or taking those actions. The spirit behind those words. Praise the Lord. Many of us have gotten it wrong because after being blessed of a word or two from the table, we don't hold on and meditate keenly on the word till it becomes a driving force controlling our thinking ability. Every time we come to, you might be studying the word of God, something will pop in your heart. I told some brethren how that I was able to chase somebody to Niger to get hold of him. The fellow had done something to me and now I study the Bible to see how that I can come up from the hook because he has put me in a very big dilemma. And I was studying the Bible and fasting and praying until I got the word. And I kept on to that word. One month, two months, and I was using the word during my prayers. Till one night I slept early morning. I prayed and I slept around 2, a, 2 to 3 a.m. I was fasting that day. I was supposed to control the fasting the following day. And then all of a sudden... The heavens were open, and I saw the guy, and I saw myself holding him. And he said, no, he has not taken anything from me. I said, really? I'm not going to let you go. And I held on him, and I held on him. He pleaded and agreed with me that, yes, he knows that he took something from me. It's only a small thing. So then in the dream, I let him go. And then when the scene went off, I got up. The following day, I packed my things and went to Burkina Faso, then Mali. When I got to Mali, I went to one church because I thought I should advance, identify myself with a church. And I went and greeted the pastor and told him why I came. And I said, I'm from Ghana. He opened his mouth. And so I was dirty because we, it, uh, it took me three days on the road. So he gave me a place and I bathed behind the church because he said I should go myself and it would take too much a time. So I bathed behind the house. And I sat down and told him that thing and I prayed with him. And he prayed with me. We prayed together. When I got up from the temple and I walked, it didn't take 30 minutes. I saw some people and then I asked them, uh, can they speak to you? They said, yes. And I saw other guy. He said, yes, he can speak that money too. So I said, great. So I put my proposal before them. It didn't take us one hour. We, held, we, we got hold of the guy because the pastor said, this is a big city. How are you going to get this guy? But we got hold of him one day, just one hour time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It was a word I stumbled upon and I held on to that word. And I prayed with it. 
You see, if we allow desperation to take all of us, the word of God cannot work as it ought to work. That's why the Bible says, be still. But most of us, when we get into a dilemma, we get desperate. Anxiety takes over. Worry becomes the order of the day for us. If you have these three things working in your life, forget it. You are not going to have the move of God's spirit in your life. Be still. And someone will say, Pastor, you don't understand. If you know the challenge I'm going to, <laughs> if, if, if you tell me to be still, I'm going to die. But you see, because why you can't be still? Because you've not known what God says concerning when we are in a given situation. It's clear. Bible says, do not be anxious for what? For nothing. But in all things, so God knows it. With prayer and supplications, and with all requests, he said, make your request known to God. And the Bible didn't stop there. It says, and the peace of God. Can you get that on the, on the, on the, on the board for me? He said, and that's the book of Ephesians. And the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding will mount God or will garrison over your heart and mind. So what does God use the word your heart and mind? Because your mind is the battlefield and then your heart is the place where faith is born. So God said he will cause his spirit to mount God over your mind and your heart. So the devil will not be able to control your mind. So your heart will be still be able to receive the word and faith will be born. So yes, challenges are bound to come, but God has shown us a way out. That when the challenges come, we should not allow anxiety. Say, be anxious for nothing. Philippians 4, 6. He said, be careful for nothing. One says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in whatever challenges you are going through, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your, you see, you had a thanksgiving. The thanksgiving is meant to calm you down. And to assure you that, yes, the supplication you are making, God is, will answer you. And he said, be made known unto God. And the peace of God, he didn't say the peace of man or the peace of the world. He said the peace of God who passes all understanding is beyond your human comprehension. He said that will keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. It will garrison, it will mount God over your heart and mind. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So until we meditate keenly on God's word, it becomes a driving force controlling our thinking ability. Listen to what the psalmist say concerning continuous meditation in the word. You think you are the only one God is told to come here and meditate? It's been the order since long time. Even the Old Testament. Look at what the psalmist said in Psalm 63 verse 6. He said, when I remember thee upon my bed. I was thinking about the Lord. And what the Lord says. When I remember thee upon my bed. And meditate on thee in the night watches. Psalm 63 verse 6. Then Psalm 119 the verse 148. He said my eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate. Or the word to ponder aloud in thy word. Bible in basic English says in the night watches I am awake. So that I may give thought to your sayings. In the night watches. He stays awake in the night to give himself to the word of God. Meditate upon it. So meditation is something that God requires of you and me to be able to ascend into the glories he had designed for our life in Christ. Meditation has some positive impact upon the word of God. It brings alive the glories of the word to bear in our lives. But what do some of us do is just to run with the initial stages of being blessed that we just get the word and that's all. We get excited either physically, spiritually, or emotionally to the word without giving it the needed constant meditation the word deserves. You need to give the word constant meditation till it becomes the driving force of your life. The word of God ought to become the driving force of your life. As I said, 
just as we eat the food and then certain things in the food that your body, your body needs will assimilate into your body protoplasm so that if you eat rice, when you go to pass, you don't see rice. All the needed ingredients in the food is taken, is, is taken into your body protoplasm. It becomes part of That's why you become fat. That's why you become fresh. In the same way, God wants us to take the word of God. And when we meditate upon the word, the word becomes part of our spirit. It mingles with our spirit. Brothers and sisters, the word mingles with our spirits. If it doesn't, then it can't control you. It's the mingling of the word with your spirit that causes your life to be controlled by the word. Because you see, we live in the senses, we sit in the senses, and we've lived in accordance with what we see, what we touch, what we feel. Your spirit is born again. Your spirit needs to take control. And God knows that without the input of his word, your spirit cannot take control. Because you were brought out of a system that you need revival, you need rejuvenating, you need transformation. And it takes the word of God to transform you. So the word needs to go into your spirit and not only will the word produce faith, but what the word does is it empowers your spirit to be able to govern his, his, what? his property. The body here is not the man. It's not your real you. It's your spirit. But because you don't see your spirit, so you think your body is your real you. So anytime your body is craving for something, you want to have it for him to appease him. But he is not the man of the house. And God understands. And that's the way we used to live. And when you live in that way, you can never please God. And Bible says, when you live in accordance to your senses, that means it says you are living a life of death. And you name what death means. Sickness, frustration, poverty, stagnation is what part of death. So God knows that our real man that has been given birth to, which is our spirit, needs to reign, we need to dominate. So when the world gets there, the spirit part of the world will now take control. It will mingle with your spirit and now begin, it will no longer be you who does those things. It is be the spirit of God that works through you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I love what God said through, the Spirit of God said through Isaiah chapter 34, the verse 16 says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. That word read also means and steady. You say, Pastor, it's not written there. Okay, if you go to a New Testament, Peter said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow by. And Paul said, What? Steady to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed by rightly dividing the word of truth. So that means if you refuse to study the word and to be able to rightly divide it, he said you will be put to shame. He says, seek the book of the Lord and read. None of these shall fail, none shall want her made. For with my mouth I have commanded them and by my spirit I have gathered them. In the same way in Isaiah 55 verse 11, the Bible says, so shall my word that go forth out of my mouth, it shall not return on back to me void but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in all that way I sent it to. This means it's not only about getting excited with the word of God, brothers. We should go beyond that. Most of us get excited with the word. Most of us. I used to be in that domain. You get excited with the word, but you leave it there. Most of us get excited with the word. And when you get excited, you think that is the end of it. No. The excitement of the word doesn't produce the power that you need to make your life successful. So not only are we supposed to get excited with the word, but diligent and consistent study and meditation of the same is what makes the word a reality in our lives. Anytime the word is working in you, there will be evidences to show as a sign that the spirit of God has totally taken over your life. There will be signs to show as a sign that the spirit of God has taken total control of your life. If the word is working in you, then it is the spirit of God that has taken total control of your life. It's not you anymore. It's not you. That's why Paul made that remarkable statement. He says, no longer I that live is Christ that what? Lives is through me. Have you seen that? 
He says, it's no what? Longer I die live. But it's Christ that what? Lives through me. That's the only way we can fulfill that scripture. Paul understood it. Anytime the word is working you, there will be evidences to show as a sign that the spirit of God has totally taken control of your life. And this is mostly seen first in our disposition. If the word is working you, it's first seen in your disposition. And I'm referring to your nature. It refers, it's, it's seen in your character. It's seen in your temperament. It's seen in your mood. It's seen in your temper or your personality at any given moment. If you see the word working in you, you can notice the word in your character, in your disposition, in your temperament. And evidence that the work is at work in us is also seen in the deeds. And if the word is truly at work in us, our words and deeds will be found to conform with his word. And the faith life will be maximally expressed through us. If the word is working, your faith will be, will be a potent force to deliver every time, every day. That's what Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He said, like the book of Romans. He said, I am crucified with Christ. When Christ died, I died with him. If I never, but nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. This is a great mystery. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He said, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. You see what he said? He said, I live by, the, by the, the faith of the Son of God who did what? Who loved me. Who did what? Some of us say we understand the love of God for our life. We don't. It's just a manual fraction. If you understand the entirety of the love of God for your life, it will turn situations around. You see, Paul repeated it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he said, Nevertheless, I live. I'm meant to die. When Christ died, I died with him. But I live. He said, yet not I. So because I die with Christ and I live, so now I ought to have Christ living his life through me. Because he's become, he's a spirit force. So in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So, he said, daily we express faith. Because now, your optical eye sees, you need to see to believe now. I mean, that's the senses. You need to type. But he said, the life down now we live through the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God. That we live, believe in what God has said concerning our life in Christ. The life we live now. So about the things that we see. So when you tell Christians that when headache hits you, and you say, look, that's a picture the devil is bringing to you. You can come out of it. They say, you don't understand. You know, now the modern day teachings have come, especially ideologists of men have come to make us believe that, no, 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 one cannot live without sin. Uh, one cannot live without what? Which is our sin. One cannot live without sickness. One cannot live without, we, it's, they say it's part of our life here on earth. But Bible doesn't say so. They are those theories that they are propounding. That's ideologies of men. And we, we, we get to hook to it. We believe those things. And so, therefore, we can live the God life that God has asked us. We are meant to be partakers of the divine nature. The God life. The very life of God imparted into our humans. That's what we are meant to live. Jesus lived there 33 years. He lived that life. And you say, oh, but he was God. Oh, Bible says he took off himself, he, he distilled himself from all the glories that he had in heaven. He came like you and me. Otherwise, his devil have meant nothing to us. If Jesus came as God, his devil have meant nothing to you because he had to identify with us in order that he can, now we can also identify with his glorious life. So he came like man. He said, the son of man. So he came like man. And he lived 33 years. He said, the devil came to me, he found nothing. And he had help from the Holy Spirit, just as we have help from the Holy Spirit. You see, sometimes if you don't take time to, to look at scriptures in this right perspective, you can't draw the right conclusion that God wants you to draw. That's what the power, that's where the power is. You need to come to a place where you draw the right conclusion. Jesus, because he came like man, so he needed the Holy Spirit. And he depended on the Father. 
So the Bible says he should be an example. So now that we have been delivered from the powers of darkness, God knew that we would need the Holy Spirit to be able to make so he gave us the Holy Spirit. And then he's there that we can always call upon him, the Father. So the same principle and procedure that Jesus worked on this earth is the same thing that God wants us to work with. Has an angel ever come to you and say, oh, you are saved? No. So Bible says, as we have known Jesus Christ, so we should walk in him. That means, how do we know Jesus Christ? We knew him through faith. So he said, all our lifetime in the flesh now, we live it by faith. And what can make faith applicable and empower faith is what? The word of God. No matter how you turn, you will come to the word of God. No matter how you turn. He said, we knew Jesus by faith, so we need to walk by faith. Because right now, our spirit is safe. Our body is still at work. Our mind is still the battleground. And for us to be able to overcome them, we need faith, the word of God. We need faith in the word of God to live. Because the Lord said, we are a royal priesthood. A holy generation. A peculiar people. We are peculiar And I love what he says. And we have been delivered from the powers of darkness that we might do what? We might show forth his glories. If we can, God won't say we show forth his glories or his virtues. We can. Everything the Bible says you can, you can do yet. Everything the Bible says. So although the enemy might want to afflict you with sickness, but this cannot stay, your health will spring forth speedily. If it's Jesus that's living you through you. Yes, sickness will come. The enemy might want to afflict you with it, but this cannot stay. Your health will spring for speedily. He might want, the devil might want to get you depressed, but instead the joy and hope finally springs up. Rejoice, I say, rejoice always, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. What situation are you going through? The word of God admonishes that we should stay with joy. Because the Bible, Jesus promised us that. My peace I give it to you, not as the world gives. Give out unto you. Do not be dismayed. Neither be, let your heart be afraid. The devil might want to get your finances in bad shape, but before he realizes your finances is taking good shape, again, if you allow the word to lift, to work through you. The devil wants to severe or ruin your relationship with people, but this relationship get right on track again, and your bond with those ones gets more stronger than ever. It says, if a man's ways pleases the Lord, even his enemies will be what? At peace with him. I didn't say that. So it takes the one that the word is working to be able to enjoy these glories I'm mentioning. The enemy wants to oppress you with the diverse kinds of challenges. But you come sailing through all of them by the help of God's spirit and you are made better off at the end. You find out there will be some time you go through big challenge and you think that's the end of the world. By the end of it, you come to a place. Hallelujah. When you stay on the word, you come to a place. When you look back, right now when I look back, I had a challenge and I thought that that was the end of the world. When I look back now, and that has been my motivation now, that if I'm able to get off from that hook, there's no hook that I can't get off because that was the biggest hook I've ever come across my life. If I can get off it, I can get off from any hook. Every one of us, that's the potential we carry in Christ. We can come out from the hook. It's only because we have not stayed on the word. There's no hook. There's no trap the enemy can lay for you that you can't come out of it. There's no shackles, no chains that the enemy has hooked you down. There's no pit that the enemy has covered you, put you deep down and covered you and sealed with cement or sealed with metal that you can't come out. When the word is working in you, you come out and to look nothing. You know, God sometimes allows the enemy to do those things. So when we come out, we now have confidence in him and we know that low oh, because there are bigger challenges that's ahead that you can't face them now so God wants you to face this one there to be a testimony that when you face this and you came out when the next one comes you now look back at how that God gave you strength to come out and so he will give you strength to do what to come out again that's the very testimony David shared concerning how that he took a bear and a lion from uh, his, his lamb from the bear and the lion's mouth. 
And then he looked at Goliath and he says, in the same manner God delivered me from help me, granted me strength and grace to bring out this bear in the same way I'm going to overcome you uncircumcised Philistine. He said, today will I take your head from your shoulders? I, I can't imagine. You see, the word makes you talk big. As I said on Sunday, the word at work in you will let you see your enemy at the foot of the mountain. Anytime you look at, you're on the mountain and you see somebody down, the fellow becomes small. Is that not it? You sit in the plane. Everything here you see becomes small. If you're in the plane. Everything. So those of us who have never sat in plane, I'm giving you a mental picture. If you're in the plane, everything is small. If one just go, go on a story building, a tent store, everything becomes small. Anytime the word is working in you, my goodness, there's no challenge that you cannot surmount. There's no mountain. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we are people who don't give up. Ever since I read when Paul was thrown with stones and he laid down and then the people came and were ready to package him and go. And in the midst of dying, Paul was still contemplating whether he should leave or he should stay. Whether he should leave or he stay. So when I leave, it will be better for me to be with the Lord. So that all these helter scatters stoning me up will end. He said, but when I stay, it will also be beneficial to some body of Christ. I have not completed my work. And then, pop, he jacked back. Hallelujah. He jacked back to life. And those who came to help him, they all walked with him back again. Nobody left. He held him and brought him. He just got up. We can come out. You see, those things are examples for us to know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, Above all that we ask or think. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God wants you to get to act the wrong way or the devil wants to get to act the wrong way and do the wrong things that are displeasing to your heavenly father. But when the word is at work in you, you bounce back again and you are empowered by God's spirit to triumph over your works, over the works of the enemy. And anytime you bounce back, God is there to just Take all of you and bring you out. Anytime you make up your mind, God is there. Just as the prodigal son's father was always waiting for him to appear. The prodigal son sat and spoke in his heart. He said, look, these things I'm going through and the food I'm eating now, my father's servants even wouldn't touch this. He said, I will arise. Hallelujah. Is, the, is life having its own toll on your life? Sometimes when we read scripture, like we come and say, Lord, I'm arising. I want to arise. I'm arising. Or you speak to yourself, I'm arising. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm coming out from this challenge. This stagnation is too much for me. I'm coming out. When you speak that and you speak that by faith, the Lord will grant you strength. It is the word at work in you that will make the words you speak a most potent force. Every time the word is at work in you, when you speak the word, it becomes a potent force. The word engrafted in your heart. Praise the Lord. All these experiences that I mentioned come expressly into play when the word of God is at work in you. The word never fails. And it will never ever fail in your life when you give it the needed attention. Hallelujah. Amen. The word has never failed. It has never. If ever the word failed, it's you who failed the word. The word has never. We say we don't believe it. Do you know the reason why we get into difficulties that we are not able to come out? There's a reason why. Why we get into situations and the difficulties we get into are not able, we are not able to come out is because we have chosen not to give God's word the needed attention as we ought. We don't give it the attention. Someone say, oh, but pastor, I stayed on the word. Oh, really? You didn't. You were maybe dig darling with it on the surface. You never allowed the word to control you. But the day you make up your mind to start giving the word the needed attention, it will amaze you the turn of events. You will begin to experience because God is faithful to his word and he watches over it to perform. Every time God wants to see his word working and he watches to perform it. Every time. As we sit now, any challenge you are going through, God is watching to perform his word that he said concerning that challenge. God is always watching. No matter how low you have been. No matter how long you have stayed in that challenge. No matter how you think that no, things cannot work again. God is staying by you now. By his spirit. Just waiting. For you to take a step. And you can only take a step by his word. The day you make up your mind to start coming out and giving up and you stay your mind on the word, 
It will abase you. The turn of events you will begin to experience because God is faithful. And he watches over to perform his word. Otherwise, <laughs> who will depend on the word? People have depended on the word. They have come out. The three Hebrew children knew that God said they should not worship any other idol apart from him. And they asked them to worship. The king, they said, we don't bow. And the king gave them opportunity because he loved them. He was using them as wise men. He said, please, look, I'll give you another opportunity. Think about it. And they told the king very clear and precise. You don't need to think about this matter. Our God will deliver us. Amen. That's the conclusion of the matter. But they said, even if it doesn't, you know what it means? Not that they are giving us. They say, even if it doesn't, we have a better, what? Future with him. Because when we die, or you put us in the fire now, and we get burned, our spirit is going to him straight. Bible, Paul said, to be absent of the body is to be present with the Lord. They, they understood that then. So see, th king, we don't need to think about this matter. And the king said, look, you people have disrespected me. Come on, fan up the fire more seven times. And the Bible says those who are going to throw them into it, they themselves got what burns. And when the three Hebrew children were thrown into the furnace fire, now we look at it, we think it's a story. <laughs> they are stuff that needs to motivate us and enrich our faith. When they threw them into there, there was a third party. It's not the same thing I'm saying right now, that God is always waiting. Where you are in the pit is waiting. He said there was a third. And even the people didn't see, but the king saw. He said, well, no, no, three people we threw here. How come I've seen a third person like the son of one? Their dress was not bent. Their hair never got bent. Their skin was intact. But the rope that was tied on their arms because they didn't tie it, it's from the enemy. That one got bent. And when the king could no longer say, come out, they walked out of the fire. What made them come out is because they stayed on the way. Daniel had the same situation. They trimmed the lions then because they said every day he stands to pray to God at some place. And the people made the king to write a decree. The king was not private to what were their, his, their intentions. So he did that. And they now started to monitor Daniel and they saw him and they went and reported. The king had no option because he had made a decree with his signet. They threw him into the lions then. They made the lion more hungry. They threw them. He sat in the den and he was playing with the lions. He wasn't meat for them. Why? Because God was there before they brought him. Brothers and sisters, God is always in that situation you get into. He got there before you got there. Every time. He was there before you came. Why? Because he knew that if he doesn't get there first, the situation will overwhelm you. But why we don't get to know is that because we have not taken his word in our heart and allowed the word to work. Anytime you do that, that's because he never, God doesn't go against his principle. That to me, you have seen well, for I will watch over my word to perform it. Jeremiah 1 12, Romans 4, 4 21 says, and being fully persuaded that, that what he has promised, he is also able to perform. So, why we can get the glories, why we can have ourselves out of the situation is because we have not given the word the needed attention. Because God said he watches over his word to perform. It doesn't matter how long you have been in the situation. It doesn't matter how hard that situation has gotten you down. It doesn't matter what you are now. It might be years. It might be decades. But let me tell you, God is still there waiting. Waiting for a word from your heart. Waiting for a word to be decreed from your mouth. Waiting for a word that your, your, your faith comes alive. He will bring you out. As though nothing has happened. And when God is bringing you out, he takes away all the scars. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I like what the Bible says in Ezekiah chapter 12, verse 28. It said, therefore say unto them, that serve the Lord God, there shall none of my words be prolonged anymore. Therefore say unto them, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 12, verse 28. Therefore say unto them, that serve the Lord God, there shall none of my words be prolonged anymore, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, said the Lord God. Shall not prolong anymore. It shall be done.
praise the Lord. Before I end, I want us to see those that have always, there's a disposition you need to find yourself to get the word of God. Work in you. And one of the characteristics or one of the keys is what? It's a contract heart. The people that easily get the word of God to work for them are those that are of a contract spirit and they tremble at God's word always. If you have a contract spirit and you tremble at God's word always, you will have the word working in you. There are those ones that also find it prudent to meditate and get themselves immersed. These are the ones that will find it prudent to meditate and get themselves immersed or occupied in God's word. When you have a contract heart, when the Bible talks about a contract heart, it's talking about a repentant heart. And you tremble at the word of God. I mean, you give reverence to the word of God. Those are the two characteristics that will let the word of God get rooted in your spirit. You have a repentant heart. And you tremble at God's word. That means you give reverential fear to God's word. It's lack of reverential fear for God's word is the reason why we always downplay it. We always put it aside and do what we want to do. It's because we don't give reverence to God's word. And the Bible says anyone who does not reverence God, he says he will treat you lightly. Hallelujah. So as yesterday says, we to say, for those things have my hands made and those things have, have, have been, said the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, of a contrite heart and trembleth at my word. As he has this is verse 2. If you go to Bible in basic English, it says, for all these things have my hands made, and they are mine. You are including you and me, says the Lord. But to this man, to this man, only will I give, look at the word, yes, to this man only will I give attention to him who is poor and broken in spirit and fear my word. I said, broken is somebody who easily repents of his ways. Fear me means the one who gives God's word refresh your fear. Hallelujah. Those that can be sorry, those that can easily be remorseful, repentant, regretful of the actions that they take at some place, apologetic at their wrongdoings, and earnestly seeking for reconciliation with God and with man. Those are the ones that God will let his word reside in their hearts. That's why he says. Some of us are not remorseful at all. We are not very repentful. We don't want, we are not apologetic. At our wrongdoing, we don't see reconciliation. Either with God or with man. We stand on our gas. What we want to do is what we're going to do. That means you are telling God you owe your life. He said there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is unto death. Go read Isaiah 66 verse 2 again and listen to it carefully. He said, for all these things my hands has made, including you who is unrepentant, the one that doesn't want to give refreshing fear to God's way. He said, including you, he has made you, and they are all mine. You belong to him, says the Lord. But to this man, will I give attention? So God said he gives attention to those who is poor in spirit, who has a repentant heart, a contract spirit, and those that fear his word. Praise the Lord. Do you get remorseful at some of your actions? Do you regret for what you do that is not in line with the word of God? That will show you that you are on the pathway for deliverance. And you are on the pathway for success. Praise the Lord. Say so those that tremble at God's word. That means those that reverence, have reverence fear, reversal fear for God and his word. The Bible says this is, this is, the ones that God is willing to give attention. I didn't say that. And you can't be remorseful, repentant, and have reverential fear for God unless his word is at work in you. When the word is working, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So the psalmist says, Psalm 119 verse 112, I have inclined my heart to perform that status always, even unto the end. He said, I made up my mind. 
and stayed in my heart to perform your status always, even unto the end. Praise the Lord. I've made up my mind. So that means we make up our minds. The psalmist says, I've inclined my heart to perform your status. Always, to the end. See, that's why the pathway he has chosen to live now. Until you come to a place that you make up your mind. Together with your spirit, your heart, that is the pathway you want to go, you are never going to make it. We come to a place that will take decisions that will affect us for eternity, either for good or for bad. Eternity with God, eternity outside of God. We take those decisions. We make our mind. Because Bible says, without your mind, I can do nothing. Brothers and sisters, we need to make our mind. Certain time we come to a crossroad, we need to make our mind. This is the way we want to pursue for the sake of our soul, for the sake of our life. And sometimes, you know what I say, for the sake of our children. God didn't touch Solomon because of David. Because of David, God left him off the hook. So when we leave, let's look, for our, let's look at our kids and cause us to make decisions that are worthy in the presence of God. If you are a man of God, you are a child of God that dis, does not make decisions at some point of time in life, you're going to have your life in disarray. We make decisions. We do. Sometimes it comes to a time you make a decision. This is what you want to do. This is the way you want to live. You make a decision. You make a decision. When you do that, you place something in God's hand to work with. We don't know. You make a decision. It's time we make decisions, brothers and sisters. We make a decision in our life. We make decisions in our family. We make decisions for prosperity. It's because of our kids. We make decisions now. So the things that you have not enjoyed, the glories of God you have not enjoyed, then our children should enjoy. We should not become like the king whom God said uh, he's not going to punish him, but after his demise, then he'll punish, he'll put a punishment on his children. He said, oh God, that one there is okay with him. That's wickedness in the highest order. How many of us know that king? The king. They came to brought him. You know him? He didn't care. That's the way most of us are living our life now. The way we are living. We don't care. But we should care. I'm, ready. I'm telling you. If for anything at all now, I live my life because of my case. So to sit down and be praying for my case, it's a long time I don't pray for my case anymore. I've come to understand that, look, live in the way of the Lord. The children, God will take care of them. So the generation of the righteous man shall be, shall be mighty. Even his children, God will take care of them. Live for your case. If you have lived up to 30 years plus, what do you want again? Live for your case. Over 28, live for your case. Praise the Lord. You live for them. Because let me tell you something. Sometimes you might not come into contact with the glory, but because of the way you have lived for your case, you live to please the Lord, you live according to God's precepts, and then your children, when they grow, God ropes them in. Things that you never even dream to touch, God will let them touch it. Things that you never even dream to see, God will let them see it. Places that you never even dream to be, God will send them there. Higher realms in life. We live for our kids. So we take decisions. When we come to a place, it's not about us anymore. It's about people. It's about your children. We need to take decisions. That's what the word of God wants us to do. The psalmist is saying that he has inclined his heart. And he knows why he did that. You know, Solomon repeated what his father said when his father died. He said, as it was said, that God said that because it was in your heart. So God placed in his hand. What's in your heart? We are living daily as if the world is for us. Yes. But now begin to think. It's a word of caution from the spirit of God. That you have kids that are coming after you. You have children. That you need their life to be better. Live for them now. Straighten your ways with the Lord. 
Let the word of God become your contemplation. Your children will have rest. They will have peace. Otherwise, <laughs> you're not going to have rest. Your children will not have rest. God forbid. I don't want to stand in the way of my kids' progress or success. You know, we can do that. We can, the way we live. We can. We live in such a way that the attention of God will be off us, the attention of God will be off our kids. Go to the Bible, you will see it several. Why the children of the poor were taken to captivity? They will take them to captivity. Can you put Hosea chapter 4 for me? Hosea chapter 4. Is it the verse 4 to 6 or the verse 6? Go on. Let's look at it as we close. Look at it. People who reject God's status, who reject God's word. God did not say he will reject them alone. He will reject their children. I want to see. I know what I'm talking about. That's what I'm saying. He said, my people are what? For what? For, be, for because thou hast what? The knowledge of the God, word of God. I will also what? And what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will also what? Mama, mama. Everything you say, I know what I'm talking about. I just want to take care. I'm telling you, we live for our kids. This is what the Bible is telling us. Because if you reject the knowledge of him and live in a reverential of fear of him, he's not only going to reject you, he'll reject your kids. You forget about them. He'll reject you and forget about them. And when we live for them, he said, even our children that are at our borders, he said, you bring them. He said, the children that are taken to captivity, he'll bring them back to their borders. It doesn't matter how long. Let's live for our kids. I want us to do something now as we bow down our head. Just make a decision now with you and God as to how you want to live. Tell the Lord. No matter what situation you find yourself, no matter how far you have gone, just tell the Lord. Because the word of God can work effectively in your life if you are disdaining his word. If you don't have refresh your fear for his word. If you are not remorseful, if you are not of a repentant heart, the word of God cannot. It cannot. No matter how much you read it, no matter how much you stay, no matter how you rattle it, it's not going to be. Make a decision. The psalmist said, I have inclined my heart to perform thy status, to live according to your ways, always, even unto the end, not sometimes, always. 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 Jesus gave a parable. He said, when one hears the word of the kingdom, and understand if you not, then come the wicked one and catch off away that which was thrown in his heart. Sown in his heart. Says, this is which received the seed by the wayside. So you hear the word of the kingdom and you do not understand. The wicked one will come and to catch it away that which was thrown in your heart. He said, you'll be like the seed that was thrown at the wayside. The enemy is always looking. Let's make up our mind now. Let's take a decision right now. Somebody take a decision right now. It's not too late. I think tonight is the night. God, Spirit is telling me to tell somebody to take a decision right now as to how to live. Life is not only about you. It's about others that are connected to you. Of the storm, 
You are the air I breathe. Oh Lord, you are. Oh, you are the air I breathe. Oh Lord, you are. You are the air. Feet right now, I breathe. Shall we sing this song together? You are the bar of give. Lift up your hand before the Lord as we close. You are the road so sharp. You are my peace. In the midst of the storm, you are the air I breathe. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, you are, you are the air I breathe. Oh, Lord. And the decision you made in your heart, write it down. Praise the Lord. It's never going to be in vain. As calm as the atmosphere is, God chooses to do what he wants to do. As maybe weak and tired as you look like, as nothing is happening to you, God doesn't depend on that. What he wants to be, he does it. Go mark it, write it down. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us now and forevermore, surely. Because goodness and mercies are following us all the days of our lives and we are dwelling in his presence now and forevermore. Amen. Don't let that decision you have made depart from your heart. Keep meditating upon it. Keep thanking the Lord for it. Keep praising the Lord that he has brought that chain to bear. Keep on doing that. Keep on doing that. The Lord is our strength. Everyone is blessed in Jesus' name.